Okay, so we'll get started. So hello and welcome to our fourth and final uh, GTC webinar for 2023. Um, so this is, as I've mentioned, our fourth webinar um, of the series this year. And I'm um, Dr. Amy Freeman Sanderson, and I'm delighted to be moderating this webinar with my uh, co-host, Dr. Vincia Pandian. Um, and our topic today is Mighty Tubes uh, sorry, Tiny Tubes, Mighty Hearts, um, a collaborative approach to tracheostomy care for children and families. Um, without um, our sponsors as well, um, it would be hard to provide education. So I just wanted to acknowledge and thank um, our uh, sponsors for unrestricted educational grants uh, that support our mission and vision at the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative, um, creating multidisciplinary teams of physicians, nurses, respiratory therapists, speech pathologists, uh, patients and families, um, and many other health professionals and support staff um, working together to disseminate best practices and improve outcomes um, and knowledge around tracheostomy care. I would also like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which we meet today. So I'm um, in Australia and I'm on Gadigal land of, and it's the land of the great Eora nation. So I also wanted to acknowledge the elders past, um, present and emerging, acknowledging them as the traditional custodians of knowledge for this land. So uh, if you want, please feel free to um, acknowledge the place where you're joining us from um, today. So the key objectives uh, for today's webinar, uh, so we've got them here. Um, so just moving through them, it's to discuss the implications for tracheostomy placement in children, acknowledging the context of other medical and developmental needs, to discuss approaches to therapy and management, to empower and support families with a focus on communication, swallowing and sensory development, really to understand the importance of person-centered care, um, and what this means across environments and managing the complexity um, and importantly also reducing carer burden, understanding the needs and perspectives of family members um, as equal partners in uh, providing education to the team and to really optimise um, our um, tracheostomy management, to discuss the role of the interprofessional collaboration across the diverse team members as it impacts um, children uh, and infants with tracheostomies. And finally, to identify strategies to maximise child development um, in the critical care unit and in that transition home. So I'm really delighted today to be joined by four phenomenal panellist members um, who have given up their time today, but also in the preparation for these talks. Um, so I just wanted to acknowledge um, the panel. So um, so we've got uh, Associate Professor and Dr. Jonathan Walsh, uh, Raquel Garcia, uh, Carly McElroy, and Dr. Michelle Morrison. Um, and Vin Dr. Vincia Pandian will do a, um, a longer lead in to their introduction. So with that, we will um, move on to the um, formal part of the webinar. Thank you, Amy. <clears throat> Hello, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon or evening. It sounds like we have folks from different parts of the world. It's truly a pleasure to connect with you today as we gather once again uh, to further our shared commitment to enhancing the quality of life of individuals with the tracheostomy and their families. Um, I hope many of you who attended the seventh International Tracheostomy Symposium are back to your routines because as many of you recall, we had a wonderful time um, at the Johns Hopkins Medicine Institution in Baltimore when we um, really got um, minds from across the globe to share insights, experiences, and foster connections. Um, the positive energy that was generated um, during that time was contagious, spurring new ideas for collaboration and paving the way for ongoing uh, conversations. I'm particularly thrilled to be part of this community and to witness the dedication of our president, Dr. Michael Brenner, and the entire GTC leadership as a chart a course for exciting activities in 2024. And today we get to participate on an, another educational journey with a distinguished panel of experts who will shed light on the crucial aspect of our mission, which is supporting children with a tracheostomy and their families as they navigate the complex and ever-changing environments that come with such challenges. Our panelists bring a wealth of experience from both healthcare professions 
and personal journeys today, providing a comprehensive perspective on the matter. Uh, so as um, Amy had mentioned, our panelists are Dr. Jonathan Walsh, a longtime acquaintance of mine from Johns Hopkins Medicine, who has extensive experience performing tracheostomies and caring for children with a tracheostomy. Um, Ms. Raquel, uh, Raquel Garcia is an expert speech and language pathologist from Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital Cleft and Cranial Craniofacial team, a hospital that's been a longstanding member of GTC. Uh, Ms. Kylie McElroy is a patient and family engagement specialist um, at Children's Mercy in Kansas City, who's the chair of the patient and family committee at GTC as well, and has a child with a tracheostomy. Uh, we also have Dr. Michelle Morrison, who's also a parent of a child with a tracheostomy and has been active in the Johns Hopkins Patient and Family Advisory Council for more than uh, 12 years. Um, she's been a huge supporter of our International Trick Symposium coordination at the Johns Hopkins Institution, both in 2016 and early this year. So their collective knowledge and experiences promise to provide valuable insights into challenges faced by children and families living with the tracheostomy and illuminate path forward. Uh, so without further ado, let's dive into today's discussion, starting with our first speaker, Dr. Jonathan Walsh. Uh, so Dr. Jonathan Walsh is an Associate Professor of Otolaryngology, Johns Hopkins School of Medicine, holding board certification in complex pediatric otolaryngology. His academic journey includes training at the University of Rochester for residency and the University of North Carolina for fellowship. Uh, prior to his tenure at Johns Hopkins, uh, Dr. Walsh served with distinction as an otolaryngologist in the United States Army. His clinical expertise is evidenced by his specialization in the surgical management of head and neck tumors, thyroid disease, vascular malformations, and fetal therapy. Um, he also serves as the co-director of Johns Hopkins Multidisciplinary Pediatric Aerodigestive System. Uh, he's recognized for his valuable contributions in the field of ankyloglossia and tethered oral tissues with a focus on the impact in infants and children. Um, and he's also the Associate uh, Program Director for Johns Hopkins Otolaryngology Residency Program and Assistant Director of the Johns Hopkins Pediatric Otolaryngology Fellowship Program. Uh, he plays a pivotal role in shaping the next generation of medical professionals. Um, his dedication to teaching and education really seamlessly aligns with the broader mission to advance the field of otolaryngology. Um, at this time, I want to hand it over to Dr. Jonathan Walsh to present on the otolaryngologist's perspective on the evolving uh, indications for tracheostomy placement in both neonatal and pediatric population. Great. Thank you so much. Uh, it's definitely a privilege to be here. And uh, that was a very wonderful introduction. I thought you were talking about somebody else for a while. <laughs> it didn't sound like me. Uh, um, but so I want to recognize, too, we've got a great panel, and I don't want to be the one that runs out of time and takes everybody else's time because everybody has some great things to say today. So uh, we're going to kind of talk about some of these evolving indications for tracheostomy placement, a little bit of the con contextualizing tracheostomy in the complex medical needs, a little bit of risk and indications, and, and having us think about considerations for early referral pathways and ways that we might have improved that. Um, so I'm going to give you my take-home points first in case you fall asleep, and then so you already know what that is. So um, chronic cardiopulmonary neurologic disorders are the evolving most common reason for children with neonatal tracheostomy. So it's overtaken airway obstruction as the primary indication. So these are children who have chronic, or many of them chronic, complex cardiac or pulmonary or neurologic disorders. Um, in, for our traditional indications of tracheostomy, non-invasive ventilation in neonates for our premature babies is likely reducing many of our traditional reasons to have a tracheostomy. So children aren't being intubated as much, uh, which is helpful, um, but it's creating a different category of children who are getting tracheostomy that didn't have before. Um, in general, neonatal tracheostomy is associated with an overall high mortality and morbidity, and in general, a lower quality of life, both for the patients and in general for the family that have it. Um, um, and intensive post-op and long-term care is necessary to help mitigate and manage these increased risks. And, and, and tracheostomies have impacts on, are associated with, but also have direct impacts on, on all domains of neurodevelopment and socioeconomic development. So it's, it's sort of a barometer 
of problems, but it's also something that should be really um, increasing our awareness that if a child has a tracheostomy, uh, it's all hands on deck for all aspects of neurodevelopment for these infants. So stepping back to a big picture kind of an ENT view, there's, it's like three primary companies that sort of are, are um, manufacturing pediatric tracheostomies for, for most aspects of the, of the world. And I'm speaking from the United States perspective, but this is sort of globally, there's a few others, but this is most of them. And so depending on your institution, you may not have access to all these three. You may only have access to one. And when we saw global supply chain problems in COVID and after, you basically to create a situation where many people have only access to one, getting a home care agency to shift manufacturers on the fly is near impossible. And families can be stuck with no access to traits and are and are washing them in the washing machine or the dishwasher and like doing all sorts of things. So just sort of big perspective is globally, we have a supply chain that is under supplying the complexities of what we need. And it is very reliant on very few manufacturers and very few um, factories. So just sort of big picture, that's what that's our state of pediatric trace in the US um, and globally. Um, you, you know, you could have talks and get into the nitty gritty details about how you put a trach in. And, and in general, we're, we're making a small hole in the anterior trach. But I think the reason for this picture is it's kind of a simple picture is because of all the things that tracheostomies do in infants, the surgical aspects are relatively minor. Uh, when we think about morbidity, mortality, implications, yes, I could talk for an hour about like different ways you might be able to do it. But in general, from an ENT perspective, Putting it in is actually the easiest thing before deciding, should I do it? And how do I manage it afterwards? And so that's my take home for that picture is you make a little hole and you put the tube in. But really, we could, I don't want to minimize the surgical part, but you know, I'm minimizing the surgical part. <laughs> this is sort of another picture where sort of, again, it, these diagrams simplify. It's a tube that helps you breathe, whether you need ventilation or not. But this what's so simplistic can have dramatic implications for the entire life of that child um with something so simple but whether it's hearing and, and station tube dysfunction speech and language development uh, mobility feeding swallowing it's just so much and we're going to hear about that later so our indications i think that the take home for this picture is we have a lot of different reasons but the top two cardiopulmonary disease and neurologic disorders are by far the most common reason we're doing tracheostomy infants. And so these, many of these are longstanding implications for the child, whether it's chronic heart disease, longstanding learned neurologic disorders. And then when you look at contraindications, there's actually very few um, um, absolute contraindications. So the, the only one absolute is that if we did the surgery, the process of doing the surgery would the child wouldn't tolerate and it was too risky. Outside of that, there's no absolute, which really brings into this complex team decision-making, ethical decision-making. Do you put a trach in and a child with trisomy 13? Do you not? When do you do these procedures? Is it the right thing for this family? That's the take home of this slide is these are complex children. They're not just simple airway instructions. And it's when to do it is not clear cut and when not to do it is not clear cut. Um, so, the, you know, the, the trends, um, you know, I mentioned this, subglaxinosis is likely decreasing across the U.S., at least, and across the world, where we're just better at managing small babies where we're not causing injury. And if we're not causing injury, we're not getting subglaxinosis. However, we have this largely increasing population. In general, we get really good neonatologists. We have very, very low birth weight babies premature infants at 23, 22 weeks that are surviving. Um, and, and we're trying to figure out at 24 weeks, where is this child going to be at 40 weeks? Where are they going to be at 60 weeks? When do you do a tracheostomy? And, and these are questions we really haven't answered. Um, even we are looking at, well, how small is too small to do a tracheostomy to? But um, we don't know these answers. Well, we are trying to guess them and we try to but that's where we are. This is a very specific population of children that um, we're managing here. 
And this is sort of data from our institution. This is our group, our pulmonary group, but they're just sort of looking at these uh, infants, uh, premature infants with bronchopulmonary dysplasia, which is a large portion of our tracheostomy infants, um, how long they're staying. And by far, if you need a vent and you needed a tracheostomy, you're in the hospital a long time. And, and this is sort of that 12 months to 15 months with wide range in those brackets. So many of these are over a year of development in a hospital, which is not really uh, designed to maximize all the aspects of neonatal development. It's designed to, to do acute care. And, and so many of these infants, that's the implication here when I see a, a tracheostomy, these children are there a long time, even if you have a rehab hospital. And there's a lot of things happening in the first 18 months of life that we're not always addressing as well as we could be in the NICU. And the tracheostomy limits, limits that. They're also not benign little devices. Um, overall, so you think of all cause mortality. So it may not be the trach that caused the problem, but these children are complex, wide range in studies, but if, you know, 2%, 1.5% to 8 or 9% of it. The, the, the trach specific mortality, the trach causing the death is low, 0.7%, but you know, the morbidity mortality is high and the complications related around this are or more than half of the infants in some studies are having some sort of problem related to the um, So by doing it, these are high risk devices. Um, and when we look at sort of national, so the American College of Surgeons and the SQIP data, so the national database book in 2016 with tracheostomies, a high rates of related because these are children have issues. There's short-term complications, pressure ulcers, false tracts, and mucus plugging, decannulations. But we also have almost 8% sepsis rate of these children, 6% uh, reoperation, 4% death, and this is sort of national database. So these are, again, highlighting that these are just major complications that can occur and that we've, this is not just one institution, this is national data that's collected. And then minor rates, you know, skin ulceration, um, pressure by the vent tubing, um, all of these that you would say are preventable, um, but are really hard to prevent. Like there's a lot going on. And then we have the long-term stuff, complications, granulomas, tracheitis, um, erosion. Um, so it's not a set it and forget it kind of situation. This is a long-term, lots of frequent care. And then for us in our institution, I'm seeing children as they grow every three months in my office because we, we need to stay on top of this. And then long-term outcomes, the same thing. So all-cause mortality in other studies was almost 9%. Um, and, and this is highlighting that there's impacts in all neurodevelopment is in the 40 to 80% of children with traits, even without known neurologic disorders, are going to have some sort of delay, um, whether speech and language feeding, station two function, quality of life, financial burden, caregiver burden, caregiver burnout, um, uh, uh, family units that are separated because of the stress of the tracheostomy. Um, when you think of feeding and swallowing, we'll get this later, only 43% in some studies of children with a tracheostomy had an oral diet at discharge. So the implications of long-term feeding when half of these children aren't even eating by mouth um, are significant. Um, neurodevelopment impairment was incredibly high, 81% in some of these studies looking at children with a tracheostomy versus only less than 40% without a tracheostomy and these children coming to the NICU with prematurity and then cognitive delay, visual impairment, hearing impairment. Um, and in general, I can say that families can't thrive and that's why this, again, the Global Tracheostomy Collaborative also exists, is like families can thrive with children and family members with tracheostomy. However, our societies are not necessarily set up to help everybody thrive. And so there are low, lower qualities of life, increased social isolation, social isolation and financial burden that as a society and globally, we have not mitigated those risks. So um, we'll go to next. And, uh, and that's where this slide is basically. There are social determinants of health that the tracheostomy um, might be the center, but the mortality morbidity is, is not just are they getting good trade care? It is, are they, can they get to their appointments? Can they afford to stay home with their child and not work? Do they have two parents household? Where do they, are, are they in an environment that has stable housing? Do they even have power to their housing? Um, we can go to the next one. So um, big picture, 
when we think about tricky estimate, when I think about it, am I putting out like, oh, am I stopping small alterations and what might they, am I putting out a small fire, which I need to put out, but am I, am I not taking a global view and say there is um, a forest fire of problems that are much beyond my little wound care problem, but there are implications of tracheostomy that we need to address um, as a community, but as societies, because uh, we're not doing a great job. So going back to my thing, pearls, it's uh, many children have complex needs. Uh, tracheostomy is a, a sign of that. Um, you know, there's changing indications for why we're doing it. Um, couple more there. Yeah, it's, they're not low risk devices and they're impacting children beyond just the moment we put them in. They have long term implications. And that is me. And hopefully I did OK. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Walsh, for illuminating us on the trends and indications for little tracheostomy tubes in the neonatal and pediatric population, uh, particularly um, drawing our attention to low birth and premature children who are surviving their initial birth challenges. So thank you. And also for really talking about the social determinants of health, which play a huge role in um, whether a child thrives through the challenges that they're facing. So thank you. Um, our next speaker for today is Ms. Uh, Raquel Garcia, who's a board certified specialist in swallowing disorders and craniofacial speech language pathology. Um, she plays a pivotal role in the Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital cleft and craniofacial team. Uh, she has over 13 years of experience uh, spanning acute care and outpatient settings, and she brings a wealth of expertise to her practice. Um, her clinical focus is on um, upper airway disorders, infant feeding, parental health literacy, developmental care, and dysphagia. And she has a lot of leadership roles um, with National Association of Neonatal Therapists um, Conference Committee, Dysphagia Research Society, um, Flasha, Asha. I think she is really out there um, advancing the field and promoting excellence in uh, patient care. We're really delighted that you're here with us, Dr. Uh, Ms. Raquel and that you'll be providing an in-depth uh, review of communication, swallowing, and sensory system development in infants and children, exploring your role as a speech language pathologist in post tracheostomy assessment and management, and highlighting some of the intervention models to reduce caregiver burden, enhance quality of life, and really maximize development. So take it away, Ms. Raquel. Thank you so much for that kind introduction. And I feel very fortunate to follow Dr. Walsh. I learned a lot today as well. Um, so I am excited to share information on the role of a speech language pathologist, working with um, patients and families, clients and families who have a tracheostomy. You can move forward. So today we're really going to be just reviewing the role of a speech language pathologist and looking at it from a communication lens, a feeding and swallowing lens, and also a sensory lens, because they're all very interconnected. And then lastly, we're going to be discussing simple intervention strategies that we can use to in, um, make connections with our families and to ensure that families are at the center of everything we do for family integrated care. So today I'm going to briefly, briefly discuss the role of the speech language pathologist. And in any setting that we work with, in the intensive care setting, in home health, private practice, outpatient, we could be working with a child with a tracheostomy. And our focus should always be looking at the child, their symptoms, their presentation, not their diagnosis, BPD, chronic lung disease, their genetic etiology, maybe APERT syndrome, but really looking at what are they doing for feeding and swallowing? What's their skill set? How are they communicating? Is it a functional communication system or is it something that's evolving? And what is going on with their development? Are they meeting their developmental milestones that's expected for their um, specific pathophysiology or are, do they need more additional supports? 
So, so we're all talking the same terminology and, you know, I never like to assume knowledge. And sometimes I remember once I had a um, client who was an otolaryngologist and their child had acute dysphagia. And I was talking about things with dysphagia and the, and the parent goes, talk to me like a parent. And I always, from that moment, I said to myself, you know, I always want to make sure we're all in the same playing field with words that we're using. So when I'm talking about swallowing, I always have two goals in mind. And Dr. Arvinson, she's she's a pioneer in our field for feeding and swallowing um, in the swallowing speech world. And, you know, in many of her um, publications and articles, she always talks about safety, making sure the child is safe, they can protect their airway. Right. We already know there's some there. We need to protect their airway at all costs. So no aspiration, no airway invasion. But then we also want to think about, are they an efficient swallower? So there's three phases of swallowing. You have your oral phase, your pharyngeal phase and your esophageal phase. They're like buddies. Right. And if you can't clear that system every time you take a bite, every time you take a, a drink of liquid, then you're going to clog this system. So I like to call it we need to clear the pipes. And in order to clear the pipes for swallowing, you have to have um, strength and coordination of each of those su subsets of muscles to do that. So when we talk about swallowing, these are our goals, safety and efficiency. And when we talk about feeding, I mean, that's there's so many goals when we talk about feeding because we all think have different ideas when we think about food. Food is very meaningful from culture to culture, from person to person. Holidays are coming. I'm sure we all have different smells and ideas when we think about the holiday and what it brings to us. But as a new parent, you have certain expectations when it comes to feeding. So I always like to review the goals with a parent of what our goal as a developmental specialist, as a, a clinician, a rehabilitation clinician, what our goals are for feeding, but I also wanna know what their goals are for feeding too. So as a speech language pathologist and in the United States, also an occupational therapist, our paths often cross, they can also target this. For one of the first goals we're looking at is that caregiver baby diet. What is their connection that they're creating during the feeding period? It's such an important bonding period that parents um, and caregivers will have. Next, we wanna think about brain growth, right? We wanna make sure the child is able to maximize their nutrition, through nutrient-dense food so they can have that adequate brain growth for development. And then we also want to think about, at the end of the day, you, we learn and sense food. You smell it, you taste it, you hear it when you chew. Um, it feels different in your mouth if you're eating a piece of turkey versus a gummy bear. So our sensory system is actively evolving as we experience different types of foods. So there's many different goals that we need to think about with um, just the act of feeding. And when we think of, and there's a little predictor there, when we think of predictability for feeding and swallowing, we wanna really think about the articulators, the mouth muscles, what are they doing? And are they doing their job, right? Their first job, their primary function is going to be, can it, does the child have an airway? Is the airway patent? right? Um, can they smell? That's something that is often very important for safety purposes. And then can they swallow? The secondary function is, can we understand the child? Can they produce speech sounds with their articulators, their lips, their cheeks, their tongue, the back of their throat, um, the up, upper part of their gums, their palate, so that way others can understand them. And oftentimes a child with a tracheostomy, you know, and I'm being very transparent here, oftentimes we kind of gloss over the oral peripheral assessment, looking at their articulators because we see the trach and we're like, okay, they have a tracheostomy. That's the problem. That's what I need to focus on. So let's get them a passing ear valve or let's get them a speaking valve. But oftentimes we have to, we have to remind ourselves we are the specialists in feeding and swallowing and speech. So we have to do a comprehensive oral peripheral exam when we're working with our clients and families because feeding and swallowing and speech all are a cortical act. It's all something that comes from the brain and it, cranial nerves. I know cranial nerves, right? Taking us back to school. Um, cranial nerves are really going to support if we can swallow safely and swallow efficiently. And also if we can have those positive feeding experiences and, and acquire feeding skills. 
So our trigeminal nerve, our, fa our facial nerve, our um, you know glossopharyngeal nerve, our hypoglossal nerve, and my favorite cranial nerve of all time, my vagus nerve, these are going to be cranial nerves that are going to support those sensory experiences and those motor experiences for feeding safety and, and swallowing. Now, if you're an older gal like me, you know who these guys on the bottom are. They're Jor Michael Jordan and Scottie Pippen, and they're like known as a dynamic duo, but so is feeding and swallowing. They're peanut butter and jelly. So if you have a delay in your feeding acquisition, oftentimes you're going to have a delay in your swallowing acquisition or vice versa. Now you can be a child that has feeding deficits, but does not aspirate, or you can be a child that loves to eat, but aspirates, or you can be a child that has both deficits, but we know they're very closely related. So when we're working with a child who has a tracheostomy, we want to ask ourselves, what, what is this child's experience with eating and drinking? Is this a child that's had the opportunity to learn to eat and drink before their tracheostomy? So perhaps when they were three years old, they were typically developing, were able to experience food and swallowing and then got a tracheostomy. So then we know they have some experiences to work on. Or is this the population like Dr. Walsh was talking about, who are your premature infants, your critical infants, your infants with different genetic etiologies, who never were able to experience feeding and swallowing during that normal acquisition because they had likely an endotracheal tube you know, in their mouth and they weren't really able to feed and swallow. So they didn't get that experience. And we know with um, central pattern generators and neuronal pruning, and neuronal shedding that if you don't have the experience, you lose those neurons. They don't want to fire together. They don't wire together because you didn't have the experience. So when it's time for you to eat, now you have the tracheostomy. You don't have the endotracheal tube in your mouth anymore. You don't have that foundational skill to want to eat because you don't have those experiences to tie it together. And when we're thinking about these, this population, where do we start? I always think of airway first. We want to make sure this population is, you know, able to protect their airway. And if they can't, how can I support them? The first thing is a preventative lens. Um, even if they're MPO, which means no food by mouth, we can support them through non-nutritive stimulation, giving positive oral stimulation with um, salient items that can really be supporting their oral um, articulators. If not, maybe we can do some compensatory strategies with different positioning or different types of um, supportive measures like swaddling. Now, if we think about if they can protect their airway, then we go to nutrition because I can't work on skill and development if their nutrition is not maximized. And I tell parents that all the time. If you haven't been maximized from your nutrition, you're not gonna be able to run that marathon. And eating, drinking, and talking is a marathon. So strategies to promote feeding and swallowing, I'll go through these briefly, but my first go-to strategy, even for the most critical ill babies or very unstable babies, is skin to skin. Skin to skin has a significant research to support how it can promote motor and sensory experiences. It not only supports the baby, it supports the parents, supports mom's milk supply, and it supports that parent-baby diet that we're looking at. Milk drops is something that's been researched by a, a nurse researcher, Barbara O'Rourke, and she's done a lot of research on the um, impact of providing milk drops to orally intubated babies and how just providing that either through a swab, a gloved finger, or a pacifier can really support that baby's motor, uh, motor and sensory development. And then lastly, motor principles. Motor principles mean we want to make sure it's specific that we're working with them. We're using real-time items that would give them that sensory experience, real food items, and that we're also doing it as soon as possible. So early intervention matters. So we'll move forward through the, through the communication slides. I was a little overzealous because I really wanted to share so much knowledge. So I'll come back another day to do that. But I did want to share something last at the end where we're talking about parent coaching. So parent coaching is a, a very important early intervention strategy that we can use to promote parent confidence and confidence. Parent coaching can be done as early as you're being consulted to work with that baby. So that way the parent can be the therapist in real time. And you're essentially teaching the parent typical development and then teaching them what their child is doing 
even if it's not considered a typical pattern, and then teaching the parent to scaffold to shape those patterns into something that we want to see as a typical developing pattern. And this is going to teach the parent to really understand their child from a pre-talking phase and also feeding and swallowing phase, but also give them the confidence to hold their child, feed their child, even giving them tastes, holding them skin to skin, and even being a caregiver um, with all activities of daily living. So lastly, my final thoughts, um, and I know this is a unicorn with a cupcake, but that's what every parent wants their kid. They want their kid to eat cake. They want their kid to go to a birthday party and celebrate. So I ask all of us today to really be the champion for early intervention and to support caregivers and parents as soon as we can be um, consulted and involved. We have to treat the, the baby and their family as humans and as a specific client that is brand new to us, like we've never seen them before, because we don't treat the diagnosis, we don't treat the tracheostomy, we treat the skill that the child is presenting with. And our job is to be the champion of development. And we can't assume that parents know what is typical development. So be the unicorn, be the one that's different in the world and really support these families. I wanna thank the um, GTC for inviting me today. And um, at the end of the day, being that unicorn is really going to help decrease caregiver burden, promote parental confidence, and really just improve quality of life for everybody, not just the parents, but the siblings and others as well. Thank you. Thank you, Raquel, for walking us through uh, the relationship between communication and swallowing, aligning them with the sensory system development. Yes, it was uh, interesting reviewing all this cranial nerves again. Um, but the point that you made about how um, they are like a tag team where you can't have one up without the other was really um, valuable. I personally experienced this myself when my son spent several months in the neonatal ICU as a newborn. And I used to sit with him for hours trying to get him to swallow food at a time when his suck and swallow coordination was impaired. And it was definitely a marathon for my son. So it really um, was real for me as I was listening to you. So thank you. Um, our next speaker is our very own Ms. Kylie McElroy, who's the chair of the Patient and Family Committee at GTC. Um, along with Emily Keevan, that many of you know, uh, she has been a strong advocate for patients' voice within GTC. Um, she serves as a patient and family engagement specialist at um, Children's Mercy in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, in 2012, Kylie faced a challenging experience of having her son born uh, premature and had a very arduous um, time in the neonatal ICU um, as well at Children's uh, Mercy. Um, eventually, he was discharged home with a tracheostomy ventilator um, and other life-sustaining equipment as well. Drawing from her own personal journey, she's transitioned into a role of giving back to Children's Mercy through volunteer work, eventually assuming the role or the position on the staff as a parent representative. And so in her current role, she collaborates with multiple teams, providing invaluable insights from the parent perspective. Uh, she also plays a crucial role in facilitating both accessibility and rehab in tracheostomy program patient family advisory councils. Um, her dedication actually extends beyond her professional responsibilities as she's deeply passionate about educating others and advocating accessibility, awareness, and inclusion uh, for all. Um, so today she's actually gonna be sharing her own journey with her son, Parker, who I've had the privilege of uh, meeting him virtually during some of our GTC meetings. And so, I look forward to hearing more, Kylie, and learning from you. Thank you, Vincia. Um, <clears throat> my name's Kylie, and um, this is Parker McElroy. He was a micro preemie born at 23 weeks and five days. Um, Parker was just one pound, 12 ounces, and shortly after being born, he was life flighted to Children's Mercy, where we began our journey. Um, he suffered a grade three, four brain bleed shortly after birth, and he spent five and a half months in the NICU. Um, he underwent a PDA ligation, which really was the game changer for him. Um, and that is what kind of started him being able to grow and thrive um, and to get healthy enough for a tracheostomy um, and a G-tube. And so in October of 2012, he had a trach and a G-tube placed. 
So um, Parker, he needed, um, he was intubated for quite a while. And finally, we were like, what is our next step? What is going on here? Um, so we heard, you know, you need a trach. So the first question is, is what is a trach? It's an artificial airway that's made by surgically creating a hole in the front of the neck and a tube is placed that allows the air to pass through when the typical route for breathing is either blocked or just not functioning properly. Um, anyone, can, I mean, there's, there's no, um, there's no, you need a trach and you're not. There's anyone can have a trach, whether it's a child or an adult. Um, Parker needed a trach because of his um, premature lungs. And so um, that was the path that we took. A trach is a lifelong commitment. Um, it's not only is it uh, a, a trach may need, may be needed for lifelong, but the side effects and all the, um, all, everything that comes along with um, complications from having a trach or from your lungs um, is really just, it's a lifetime commitment. Um, it's a way of adapting and breathing to continue a life. Um, having a child with a trach really changes every aspect in your life. Um, when a trach comes, with a trach comes numerous other medical appointments and equipment. Um, it really has a lot of complications and it, it um, really takes a toll on every, every avenue of your life. Um, daily functioning, daily choices. There is, you always need the extra hands for help. Um, life with a trach is just different. Um, whether the trach is needed emergency, emergency, emergency placed or as a planned surgery, these families have spent or will be spending a lot of time in the hospital. Um, my, my, my two, my advice is to just get to know them um, encourage them and, and just help them along their journey. Um, while we were in the hospital, we had met some of our biggest fans. Um, our, here we have, um, Parker as his, uh, first Halloween. And then our, um, wonderful Dr. Um, Winston Manitim. He is the infant home vent coordinator at Children's Mercy, and he um, became our, our lifeline. Um, and then this is our unofficial nurse primary, Annie. Um, they were two of our biggest encouragers and supporters. And so what I um, try to encourage the families and try to encourage to providers is that you really are our role models. You are our, um, you are our advocates. You are teaching us though, as the, at the same time. So we are trying to learn to advocate for our own children as you guys are advocating for us. Um, we really look to you for everything. Um, and so I always just try to say like, support the families, encourage them, be there for them. Um, because that's, that's really what we need. You guys are the beginning of our you guys are there at the beginning of our journey and you're what um, start to show how how the relationships need to build and what kind of support we need to have um, along our journey. So um, after Parker spent five and a half months in the NICU, he was finally discharged home. And uh, of course we were discharged home right in the peak of um flu season, right? RSV and all the things. Um, so our life began November 28th in 2012 as managing our trach at home. Home really becomes an ICU away from the hospital. Um, except for the difference is, is our lifelines pulled away from us. That safety net we had um, with everyone just hugging us daily, whether physically or just emotionally, is it's literally gone. Um, so managing a trach at home, you have your home nursing, you have medical equipment and supplies, and then the big trigger, the lack of sleep, right? Because you have alarms, you have appointments, you have more alarms. Um, 
you really adapt every second of the day. You're just learning and changing and adapting. Um, bedside cares in the hospital become your coffee table cares or your dinner table cares. The first night we were at home, we had three emergency trait changes because he just got too dry and plugged up. And we were quite literally changing his trach on our dinner table. Um, and it really opened up our eyes for what life was going to be like quickly um, at home. It was all on us and we had to, we had to depend on ourselves. Um, but thankfully we had, you know, that education at the bedside and we had the experience and because we were very hands-on at the bedside, but it's still, it is just different being at home. Um, on top of all the care in the home, then you have to compile with the appointments. And when you first dis discharge home with a trach, you have lots of appointments, whether it's specifically um, for tracheostomy care, whether it is for um, follow-ups on hearing or on speech or on your vision. Um, as was said earlier in the presentations, a child with a trach also has lots of other um, difficulties or struggles. And so um, I remember for the first several weeks that we were discharged, we had sometimes three days of appointments a week. And at the time we lived an hour and a half away. Um, so that was just one way traveling to appointments. Um, all the equipment, always two caregivers at least. Um, and so it is a lot. And we quickly learned that life at home would never be the same. Um, so our big thing is that we wanted Parker to be able to live life as much as he could with a trach, right? Um, we did lots of activities. We always, uh, kept busy. A lot of times we were just in our home because you fear of anything or anyone looking at you that you might, that your child might catch something. Um, so we did lots of things in the home. We had Christmas photo shoots for our Christmas, our first, um, Christmas. And we had, you know, we would have friends over and, and have play dates and bumbos and, and you try to make normal, you try to make things normal as normal as you can when you have, um, a ventilator going and you have the suction machine running and you have the, the feeding pump alarming. And, um, it's just, it is a lot. Um, for our first year or our first few years, um, Parker did require his ventilator. Um, and with that came lots of other um, needs. And so we really probably have, vis has vis have visited most of the clinics, um, rehab, vision, audiology. Um, and so these are just a few of the photos that I chose that represented Parker in kind of our life, being active, being at the zoo, um, and just trying to uh, just trying to live with a trach. Um, in 2015, Parker was actually able to be decannulated, and so um, we started life after decannulation, and that um, also just brought that brought a whole new world. Um, life with a trach is very stressful and, um, busy. Um, and you think getting that trach out is going to somehow change. Well, it does, it does change drastically. Um, but this, the need for adaptations and the need for equipment, it's still there. Um, so here we have Parker, um, and he's much older now. He was decannulated in 2015. And so the photo, the four collage was him um, after discharging from getting his trach out. Um, and then these are just a show of photos of different experiences that we're trying to give him because for so long he fought to live and now we want to let him live. Um, so we, we have adapted PE in school. Um, it's in his IEP. We advocate for it. We help fundraise to buy equipment so that um, his school can have the necessary things for our kids, and not just Parker, but for our kids in general um, that require special equipment. 
Um, Parker was chosen for um, a Halloween costume that was made for him. Um, a local robotics team built him a mobile DJ and he was quite the, um, he was quite the hit at the Halloween parties and um, for the local news stations. And so uh, we really are just, we try to live life and we try to advocate and support our other families and encourage them to get out. Um, there are resources out there and that's what's so important for you guys to help our families know that it's okay to get out there and it's okay to live life because you will always have something to fear. You will always have something to worry about, but if you constantly live in that fear, then, then what, like, what are you doing? Um, I completely understand the scariness and what happens if this, or what happens if that, but what happens if you just stay in your house and you don't go anywhere and you don't live and you don't let your child be a kid. Um, we literally just got back from Florida two weeks ago and um, we went to Disney. Um, Parker rode rides and he met characters. I mean, we had an amazing trip, um, even though it was rainy and sprinkly and kind of chilly. Um, and you never would have thought that when you're planning a trip to Florida because you just think of the sunshine. But we had the best time and we came back and he caught RSV and flu. And so he was impatient. And someone said, oh, that stinks. Do you think you brought it back? And I'm like, I don't care. Like he, he had the time of his life. He just laughed and he giggled and he played and he swam and he went to the beach. And those are all experiences that he, just like any other kids deserve to have. Um, even though his life may have started different and may continue to look different, um, our kids deserve that. So um, that's that's my spiel about being a parent and our journey with a trach. Um, we, I really just try hard to advocate and encourage and support our other, other families that the burnout is real. It is exhausting um, with a trach, without a trach. Like it is hard, but it's worth it. It's just worth it. So um, thank you for listening. And I hope you enjoyed our pictures. And I hope you would just encourage your um, patients to live life and to enjoy the moments that they have because it is priceless. Thank you so much, Kylie, for sharing your journey and some of these wonderful pictures from some of your fun outings and to really make it um, a real life for your son. I'm truly in awe of your resilience through this journey with your son as you continue to step up and advocate for children with a tracheostomy. Um, our last speaker for today is Dr. Michelle Morrison, who's a dedicated parent with a child uh, with a tracheostomy as well. Um, she's um, been doing a lot of work in advocacy within the healthcare community uh, with over 12 years of active participation in the Johns Hopkins Patient and Family Advisory Council. She's played a vital role in contributing to um, valuable insights and perspectives um, as a parent. Um, Michelle is also a co-founder of Little Lobbyists, um, an advocacy organization that's focused on championing the rights and needs of children with complex medical conditions. Um, she's been instrumental in shaping initiatives and policies that directly impact the well-being of these children. Um, she's both a committed parent and a proactive advocate, um, improving the lives of children with complex medical needs. Um, she um, will be presenting this um, today, um, her insights and experiences as a parent, emphasizing the significance of fostering positive and proactive engagement with families. Um, her discussion is going to dive into strategies and supporting the wider community, offering valuable perspectives on effective community involvement and cooperation. Thank you, Michelle. Thanks, Vincia. So I will try, I know that we're running a little over, so I'll try to, 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 to be brief, but um, I wanted to first off introduce you to um, Timmy. So um, anytime I talk about Timmy, I like to first and foremost, he's a seventh grader. He's um, loves Star Wars. He's playing basketball. He plays in a school orchestra. And I feel like it's important to recognize that first and foremost, he is a kid. 
right? He also happens to have a trach. He also happens to have a host of other medical complexities. Um, he was born with a laryngeal cleft. Um, we did spend our first six months or so um, hanging out in the NICU. Um, but more, more than all of that, he's a kid. And so one of the things I want to talk about is sort of what life is like with, a, you know, like some of what Kylie was saying too, like what her experiences with Parker, what it's like having a kid. So we've been living the trach life for the last 13 years or so. And everything that Jonathan was saying about the beginning, about caregiver burnout, about social isolation, about developmental delays, about things being hard and exhausting, all of that is true. We also have a fantastic quality of life, but we have worked very, very hard to build that quality of life. And our society is just not really set up um, to make that easy on families. So I think one of the things starting off with is thinking about, you know, from a provider perspective, um, I know a lot of folks on the call are, are healthcare providers, but thinking about like, what could healthcare provider teams be better at communicating? And I don't think there is any magic bullet here. There's no magic message that you should be giving. Um, but I think recognizing that communication often takes place through rose-colored glasses. This is done from a well-meaning desire to present things in the best light possible, right? You don't want to overwhelm families at the beginning. You don't want to, to make it feel like this is like a dark and dreary and terrible life and anything, because it's not. But it also means that oftentimes the challenges get glossed over. Um, I think a lot of this, though, also stems from a lack of understanding of what home life is actually like. So providers will imagine, they'll think that they understand, they'll say, okay, I know what the, you know, what all the physical care looks like, so it must be just that at home. Um, but that's not actually the case, right? And thinking through, you know, like what it's like actually as a pa patient or a family at home, it's very, very different than anyone prepares you for. Um, this results in parents who are ill-prepared for life at home. I've never talked to a trach family who actually felt like they left the hospital ready, you know, for this life, even if they thought that they were ready when they were getting ready to head home. We thought we were ready, um, but we certainly weren't ready for life at home. Um, Kylie also mentioned this, and I think this is important to stress, that living with a tracheostomy and medical complexity impacts every single thing that a family does and every single job or every single decision that you make, whether big or small, every single thing that you do um, is impacted by the tracheostomy. And it's important to understand sort of the dynamics that families are, are dealing with. And then the last thing I don't feel like is even worth, we all know this, right? Hospital systems processes are very, very difficult for families to navigate. They're oriented around um, providers, hospital administration and all of that, but it's hard for families to know how to navigate this. And when you think about that in the larger context of all the other systems that families are navigating, schools, um, educational systems, uh, complex programs for insurance, all that kind of stuff, it's, it really is, is challenging. So when you're getting ready to go home from the hospital, um, education, you can go to the next slide, um, typically focuses around this stuff, right? So this is where, you know, I got this list of things, you know, questions that families deal with. Um, how do I use a feeding pump? How do I deal with a mucus plug? How do I change a trach? How do I change ties? Um, how do I, you know, watch out for signs that my kid is having trouble breathing? This is where the training is focused. I pulled this from my own experience as well as, you know, some various different tracheostomy handbooks that are online. Um, we felt confident, this is Timmy when he was little, we felt confident with his care by the time we left. We were six months in, we'd been taking care of his trach daily um, for the entire time. We felt really good about that. In the last couple of days, I said, okay, you've learned how to do all this stuff, now do it on your home equipment. And good, you're good to go, right? You're right, you're right at home. On the next slide, um, these are the kinds of questions that families are actually wrestling with. This is what families actually have to learn. These are just examples. It's not worth going through all of these, but it's way more than how do I change a trach? How do I go to the grocery store? How do I sleep? How do I stay awake while I'm driving home from work? I've worked full time for the entire time that we've had you know, a child with a trach. How do I stay awake if I haven't slept all night and go and do a good job at my job? You know, How do I find enough vacation time to be able to handle all of those medical appointments that Kylie was talking about? How do I go on a roller coaster? You know, how do I deal with the, you know, $20,000 of incorrect medical bills that I received? You know, how do I get enough supplies? How do I help my siblings cope? How do I deal with adolescence um, as we're navigating through this? How do I deal with all the questions that other kids ask, right? These are the kinds of things that families are dealing with. And these are the kinds of things that families are not at all prepared for um, when they go home. And I'm not necessarily saying that it's 
medical providers responsibility to teach all of these things, right? But it is critically important that you as providers understand that this is the reality of life that what families are dealing with. It's a much bigger thing than how do I change trach ties? Um, I feel like the training we received in the hospital was the easy stuff, right? Changing the trach, doing the ties, all of that was the easy stuff. This is the harder stuff that is is much more um, reality in terms of what um, families are are getting prepared to um, to handle. Um, so you know we learn to suction right in the hospital, but no one taught me how to suction when we're driving at seventy miles an hour down the highway, right? So we learn to change a trach, but nobody taught me. How do I change a trach when my son's trach came out in the middle of the night? I can't find my glasses. I can't figure out where the light is to turn it on. And I've got to get that trach in fast, right? I have to figure out how to deal with all of that kind of stuff, right? The reality is very, very different from um, what life is like in the hospital. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to encourage um, everyone that how do we get there, right? How do we improve things? How do we set things up so that families like my family and Kylie's family are feeling better prepared. I will not say that it's maybe ever possible to be completely prepared for life at home, but how can we do this better? I think the key here is better partnering and engagement with patients and families. Um, in my experience, provider teams rarely truly value lived experience. Patients and families are often included as afterthoughts when it comes to training. Like, so maybe you kind of say, okay, does this training look good, right? Does this look right? But including patients and families from the very get-go, what should we be training families to do? What is it really life like at home? How do I, you know, make supplies work for the situation I'm in? And I think that typically the education of patients and families is very one-sided, right? So typically we are seen as people who need to be educated, right? This is 100% true, particularly at the beginning. We need to be educated. This is all new. We need to learn. However, just like providers develop expertise over time and through their education and their training and all of that, we develop expertise as well. And this expertise is particularly critical in those areas where providers lack expertise and understanding in what it's like at home. And so I'd like to just encourage everyone to see patients and families as experts, value our expertise, reach out to us, engage with us, learn from us, and let us help contribute to sort of improving um, what this training is like for, for families. And I will stop there. Yeah, thank you so much, Michelle. I actually like that statement on your slide that says, listen to us, learn from us, value our expertise. I think it's really powerful, truly really highlights the importance of recognizing the insights and perspectives of patients and their family members. Um, I often hear people saying um, that patients are not given a voice, but I think we really need to realize that they are the voice. And so we really need to listen to them, um, as Michelle said, from the beginning, as we start that conversation about the need for a tracheostomy and all the way through until that tube is out. So I do have a question for you, uh, Michelle. Um, in your professional experience, where do families commonly seek additional education beyond the training that's given in the hospital? So I think it comes from a number of different places. Um, sometimes it's calling back and asking questions, right? I don't think that that's typically the case. I think more often it is Google, it is social media, it is trial and error. It is experience. If you happen to know another family with a, a kid with a trach, once um, Tim, we finally met our first other trach family when Timmy was five and it was like, woohoo, we can, you know, share all kinds of stuff with these other families. Um, so um, shared that way. Um, but um, it's typically not, I will say, like it's often not reaching back out to providers. It's reaching out to other easier avenues, social media, searching stuff up on Google, um, et cetera. So. Thank you, Michelle, for sharing that. Um, I did have a question for Dr. Walsh. Um, how can anticipatory guidance be delivered to families in advance of tracheostomy procedures for their infants at a time when they're already very anxious and there's a lot of uncertainties about what to anticipate? Yeah, and I, I would say the first part of that is the physicians are not always the experts at how to deliver this information. And so you have, you can have information overload 
And and when you have this moment where, in many sense, there's not good alternatives to a tracheostomy for many children. So the, the decision and the conversation is often, we need you to agree to this procedure and sign consent for this procedure. When in reality, like we know you cannot leave the hospital unless this happens. Um, however, we also in the background know exactly what both of these parents have said is the implications of this relatively small procedure are very, very significant. And so how do we, and I don't have the great answers, but how do you have a conversation that does not overwhelm, that meets them where they are, but steps with them throughout this process? Because if I just say, I need to do this trach, well, what are the risks of it? Well, long-term speech and language development, long-term feeding things, social isolation. Maybe you can't work again. You know, all you know, you may or may not have home nursing. You may not sleep for the next ten years. You know, there's a lot of. I cannot have that conversation on day one, but uh, we cannot ignore it. And you can't just say you're set to go. Here's your bag, and kick families out because then the, each person, each family is learning this on their own when they don't need to. Like we we have enough information to know every family is going to go through this on some level. Um, but we're not good about it. So the backstory of, I don't have a good answer for that, except that you cannot do this on a one-on-one -on -one conversation. It cannot be just the physician. There, there should be families and other families with traits that are doing that child life specialist, everybody helping this family make this decision. Because it, like, again, in some sense, it's not a decision, but it's posed as, hey, do you want to do this? Um, but we can't pretend that any family in that moment when they've already been there six months in the NICU is in the right place to comprehend the lasting impact of that decision right there of do you do a tracheostomy or not. So that's, I would say, I don't have a good answer, except it's not one conversation and it's not one person. Um, because if you limit it that, and I usually start part of my consent process when I talk to them, I was like, Right now it's overwhelming and, and the thought of you taking care of this is overwhelming, but I will, we will get you to the point where you will be your child's expert on your child's trait. Where you go to the ED, you're going to know more about it than anybody in this community. You're going to know more about it than I am, even though I'm putting it in. And so like I say that we're going to get you there um, throughout the process, but it's not one person getting you there. But every family usually is going to be the expert on their child's trait. Thank you, Dr. Walsh, for highlighting that it's not just a one-time or one-person mode of delivering the content, but it need, it might not even be like two or three times. It's going to be an ongoing conversation. And from listening to Michelle, it sounds like once they go out into the community, that's where a gap is existing right now in terms of our patients and family members being able to reach out back to healthcare providers. Um, because it sounds like they're reaching out to other um, sources. So there's definitely more work to be done in that space. Um, I did have a question for uh, Raquel as well. It's a little bit more technical. Um, this is a question that I've seen uh, multiple times pop up um, at the end of our webinars. Uh, they keep asking whether um, we need to, in or maybe you can share your experience. Do you incorporate blue dye testing? in swallowing assessments for children with a tracheostomy? Yeah, that's a question that is always frequently asked. And oftentimes it comes from all different providers, um, not just parents and, and um, community providers. Um, so blue dye testing is something that was used many, many years ago before we really had good access to um, you know, direct objective instrumentation for swallowing. So direct instrumentation for swallowing could be a video fluoroscopic swallow study, which is a lateral view of the swallow. And you can really see those three phases of the swallow from the oral pharyngeal esophageal phase of swallow. Um, or you can do something called a fiber optic endoscopic evaluation of swallowing, which is a, a transnasal assessment that you're doing just a superior view, like that top-down view of the swallow. Um, and you would only really see about the pharyngeal phase of the swallow um, when you're doing that view. But as a speech pathologist, when you're thinking about feeding and swallowing, the blue dye test really doesn't give you any information except the child may aspirate because it's not 100% accurate. 
Um, but as a speech pathologist, you want to know more about the child's swallow, their physiology, and how you can support them um, and, and increase their strength, their safety, their efficiency. So what I always do as a speech pathologist is I always look at their feeding skills. What, what type of skills do they have that can translate into a functional um, developmental task, like eating or drinking, whatever their age is that I'm looking at. And then I look to see if they're functionally swallowing at the bedside, possibly with maybe some taste, their own saliva, with a pacifier. And then once we're getting them to a point where we um, can start doing some trials, then we would take them to um, for some instrumentation. This will give community providers, if you're a hospital-based um, occupational or speech pathologist, this will give your community providers so much information so they know how they can start helping them. Because to ask a parent to take their child with a tracheostomy and a ventilator to come back to the hospital to get a swallow study, then we're really missing the mark because then we're expecting them to do things outpatient. And that's something that's told a lot to parents like, oh, you can get that as an outpatient. And that's not fair to them. If they're inpatient and they've been there for six months or a month, like, let's just get it done. Let's see what we're working with so we can really develop a patient specific plan of care to help their swallow rehab and to help their feeding skills move forward. Thank you, Raquel, for sharing your experience uh, with swallowing and really encouraging people to um, do those evaluations sooner than later to improve their quality of life. Um, at this time, I want to um, check with Dr. Amy Freeman Sanderson if there are any questions from the audience. Uh, yeah, there's a couple that have been coming up in um, chat, which I'm sort of just looking at now. So, um, but I had a I had a question for Kylie, um, and it was really, you know, like thank you so much for you know being um, so open and sharing your story across um, so many, um, you know, different aspects of, um, you know, what um, Parker, you know, has needed across his development till now. And I'm just wondering, you know, having that unique experience that you have, you know, uh, as a parent and also from the hospital side, you know, reflecting back and, you um, this might be a hard question, so I'm sorry, but what are two or three things that you think like really stood out that facilitated your journey that were really sort of a turning point in terms of a springboard? Um, and it's really sort of a takeaway that we, you know, that you would like the audience to hear that we could start being that, um, you know, the advocate and doing that that small amount of change and on mass, um, you know, bring about, you know, a change movement. So what should we keep doing and what are, you know, things that we um could start doing? Yeah, um, I think the biggest um, suggestions and thoughts are that um, to begin with, um, I had a really great, and I still do, I have a great support system. My husband is phenomenal and very hands-on. Um, he was there almost every day of our NICU journey until he had to go back to work because one of us has to work, right, to pay bills. Um, so I was one of the ones that um, I was able to stay home um, but that really then brought about that isolation and, um, the depression and the anxiety and because you're alone and you're starting this journey of a medical life that you had no, um, you, you just, that's not even something you dream. Of. I mean, you just can't even think of these things. Um, and so I think that the best um, advice or the best things you guys can do as providers is encourage our families and support them in networking. Um, our life really improved twofold. A, when we moved out of our small town, we moved to the city um, and, and just right there had more access to resources, whether it was therapies, um, preschools, um, or networking with, with friends. And then that, and that was the second part is that, um, the friends that experienced the life with the trach or they experienced the medical complexities, um, that we were experiencing really, um, is what makes or breaks the life. Um, you need that support and you need that, um, basically the safety net, like your friendships are what, kind of take hold that safety net that you feel when you're in the NICU or when you're in the hospital, when you have all the 
um, bedside providers. Um, so friendships, networking with fa other families who are on this journey. Um, that is really something that I encourage our families in my role, both as a parent and then at um, my role as the parent on staff for Children's Mercy is I just encourage our families to find others. Um, I have a Facebook group just for our Children's Mercy trait families that we can um, reach out to together and we have different boards. And so um, that's really what we, what, what we think is like, just find a friend, you know, just find that buddy um, or find those three buddies who get it and that are texting you at 2 a.m. because gosh darn it, that pulse ox is alarming and you're awake. And 15 minutes later, they're probably awake too. Um, and so just find, just find your circle that get it. Um, so yeah, great question. Yeah, thank you uh, so much for that. Um, in the uh, sort of chat, there's been a few comments as well about um, really considering the diversity of you know parents and carer groups as well. Um, and a, a couple of people have raised just um, looking at supporting foster parents as well. So looking at how we sort of foster um, you know diverse um, parenting and carers at home as well. So um, you know some really um, insightful thoughts so thank you for um, the audience members that have put those in as well um, we've had a couple of question and answers and thank you Dr Walsh I've seen you've been responding to some of those live as well so um, I think it's really uh, people are noting that family engagement um, is something that is on the agenda as an important as something that needs to um, really be addressed and move forward uh, for um, you know, improved and, and better outcomes for everyone. Um, so with that, I would like to um, thank wholeheartedly the panellists again uh, for their insights, for their wisdom, for their knowledge. Um, I feel like there has been so many learnings that have been shared with us today for really, uh, you know, everyone to go back and reflect on, start those conversations with your uh, networks create new networks, new connections, and sharing that information in terms of how we really support and provide better care. Um, the webinar is recorded, so that's been a couple of questions. Um, it will go up um, in a couple of days' time to our um, GTC YouTube channel. So all of the prior webinars are also there, freely accessible, accessible at whatever time. So I know we've got many people from across the globe, so at a, a time that also um, you can watch them. So we are um, committed to ongoing education and I'm very excited to say we've got um, some great webinars already planned um, for 2024. So um, just in terms of your calendars, the first one will be in February. Um, so we will make sure that those email blasts go out. Please feel free to pass on the um, you know, you know, the ad, the blast to anyone else that also may be interested or would like to register and, um, you know, can watch the education afterwards. So um, I think uh, also um, Dr. Pandian and Dr. Brenner as well for the ongoing partnership um, to all of this happen and all of the uh, administration work that happens behind the scenes. So um with uh, marissa and skylar and the rest of the team so with that um thank you again for joining us and for your time and good night or good morning or good middle of the day from wherever you are thank you everyone yeah such a joy to just hear everyone's stories and uh, have such engagement from the group on such important topics uh, that we all learn from and uh, certainly gives me personally a great sense of humility and uh, honor to be in the company of all of you wishing everybody a wonderful evening <laughs>